in colorectal and critical care. And so now the general surgery uh, talks begin. Uh, some of these will be on during our alumni weekend a couple of weeks from now, uh, actually a week from Saturday. We don't have room for all of them, so we have to sort of have short straws and uh, short straw, long straw. Mary Catherine uh, gets to go first uh, here today. Uh, as I think everyone probably knows, she's a Alabama native, Alabama graduate, University of Alabama medical school graduate that we were ha happy to recruit here and uh, along the way during her residency here she's picked up a husband and a couple of children and still been able to finish with the uh, required case volume and experience necessary to graduate. So she's going to give her talk today where she's staying with us of course in Chattanooga uh, and actually within our department to do our vascular surgery residency fellowship uh, and we look forward to having her continue on here. So. She's going to talk about something that uh, <coughs> actually our residents uh, from this program have been particularly astute in and accomplished in being able to do, and that's be teachers. I don't know if many of you all may not know, but I think at last count, it's either seven or eight of our graduates are now program directors of uh, residency programs somewhere in this country or here, and that's something to be very proud of because I don't think there are very many programs, certainly not one the size that can uh, that can brag about that. So this is something that uh, that's been near and dear to us in the program. We look forward to your discussion of it, Mary Catherine. Good morning. So I have no disclosures. Like, like many of us. Um, I do want to give a, another di sort of disclosure. I am not an expert. Um, I would like to thank the teachers and leaders who have um, published data on surgical education and adult learning because while uh, the slides are my own, the, contact is heavy, the content is um, heavily borrowed and is certainly theirs. Um, so when I was preparing for this talk, I thought about you know people in my life that have been uh, meaningful and who have taught me things. So I would also like to ask you to um, take a minute to think about the teachers in your lives that have been impactful and then what characters they possess that you had tried to emulate in your own teaching. Um, specifically, though, I wanted to take a minute to um, thank Dr. Witherspoon, who is a big part of the reason that um, I was recruited to Chattanooga. Um, I'd like to thank the admissions committee and Dr. Burns for giving me the opportunity to um, learn general surgery in Chattanooga. Um, I would also like to thank my um, co-intern class, as well as my co-residents, for um, not only supporting me, but supporting each other, for teaching me and allowing me to teach you, and for upholding the culture of the legacy of this program, for providing opportunities for excellence, um, laughs and tears and support. I'd like to thank Dr. Arnold for teaching us all the key to life is better lighting and for the importance of verbal scripts and cues in order to get your case started, get what you need, and find out who's helping you. So objectives today, um, we're going to discuss briefly why this is relevant. Um, we'll provide some historical content, um, talk about principles of adult learning, where and how do we teach, and also um, some principles of feedback. So until recent history, surgical education uh, has been based on passing down of operative techniques from one generation to the next through apprenticeships. As surgery slowly evolved from uh, trade into a profession, the apprenticeship model remained the standard of surgical education. Still, there were very few guidelines or, or no guidelines for what knowledge or skill was taught, who should be trained, when training should start, or how long training should last. The end of the um, 19th century and beginning of the 20th marked the first major shift from the apprenticeship training model to um, what's known as the Halsteadian model today. Um, this method has been utilized in the United States for the past century and is in a large part due to the influence of William S. Halstead. The Halsteadian model is see one, do one, teach one, and the surgeons who now serve as mentors to our generation of surgery residents were able to accept increased responsibility as they progressed through their years of training. 
Surgery was learned through direct observation and then by imitating the actions of a skilled mentor, both in the operating room and um, in the clinical environment. However, over the past several decades, due to the increased scope of education and um, also the reduced number of work hours in which to train, uh, it's been identified that we need more efficient and structured perioperative and intraoperative instruction. <clears throat> Furthermore, innovating teaching methods uh, are needed, especially ones that focus on adult learning. This, um, it's also has emphasized that resident physicians have a unique and vital role in the education of not only junior residents, but also um, in educating medical students. So through a surgical residence interactions with medical learners, um, discussions with patients and conversations with colleagues, um, he or she has a responsibility to educate. This makes the knowledge of adult learning principles and effective instructional methods essential to successful practice. Furthermore, the cultivation of teaching skills requires continual engagement in the learning process, leading to deeper conceptual understanding and personal growth. Um, clinical competence correlates positively with teaching skills and abilities, and this not only hits on um, dedication to lifelong learning, um, but also interpersonal and communication skills competencies. So in 1982, the ACGME was created, and then in 1999, uh, the ACGME defines six core competencies that residents must achieve and master during their training. Uh, these are medical knowledge, patient care, professionalism, interpersonal and communication skills, practice-based learning and improvement, as well as systems-based practice. As you can see, uh, within the practice-based learning, teaching is a, is a major component of that, um, and you can see how that's defined. The um, competencies were then further revised to create milestone reporting. Um, so this is something that must be um, <clears throat> mastered uh, prior to graduation. Requirements from both the um, LCGME for medical students as well as the ACGME for residents um, both address the importance of a resident's role as a teacher. Um, as such, the um, LCME for medical students requires that um, institutions provide resources like workshops and written materials, uh, not only to um, enhance the teaching um, of the residents, but also how the residents evaluate um, their learners. Also is required formal assessment of the teaching and evaluation skills of the residents by the medical students. Um, this, of course, is from the UT website that's available on Blackboard. Um, so these are our institution-specific resources. In the uh, Program Director's Guide to Common Program Requirements, um, the ACGME requires that residents develop skills and habits to be able to participate in the education of patients, family, students, residents, medical students, and other health uh, professionals. And programs must describe the structured learning activities that support uh, these missions. Uh, and this is uh, what is included within the SCORE portal um, defining modules um, that we are required to review um, to achieve that competency. So there's some challenges to do this. We all know that um, residents' role in teaching is um, important. Um, it's also unique in educating junior residents and medical students. And this has been well documented in the medical literature, especially over the past uh, 30 years. Uh, residents are um, very effective teachers in a clinical setting, especially to medical students, because they can not only emphasize practical aspects of patient care, but they have also recently been a medical student and um, understand the needs of medical students, like passing your shelf exams and things like that. Um, it's also a valued thing by attending physicians. Medical students report that the interaction is valuable to them, and they gain significantly from their educational encounters with residents. Um, they, medical students report that up to a third of their education is provided by resident physicians, and up to 25% of residents' time is dedicated to teaching medical students. And these teaching responsibilities begin early. Uh, there's a dramatic shift from learner to teacher from a PGY-1 to a PGY-2 year. Um, this has also been well documented in the literature. Unfortunately, there are barriers to this um, for residents, including 
lack of time, lack of confidence, insufficient role models, limited awareness of service-specific learning objectives for MS3s, and also lack of or insufficient formal instruction in the principles of adult education or effective teaching methods. So in order to address this, um, the American College of Surgeons um, devised on a national level the Residences Teachers and Leaders Program, um, which a lot of um, this data borrows from and um, was suggested by Dr. Burns that I include this. Talking about some principles of adult learning, adults learn best as active participants in a learning that is tailored to their individual needs, builds on past experiences, and has direct applicability to their daily activities. It's also delivered in a positive learning climate. Adult learners should participate in the identification of their own learning goals, as well as have the opportunity to practice what is learned through self-reflection, coupled with constructive feedback. Um, effective teachers to this end encourage dialogue, ask questions, and give meaningful feedback. So um, we'll talk about each one of these facets in just a little bit more detail. A positive learning climate doesn't mean an easy learning climate. Um, it doesn't mean one in which the stakes are low. A positive learning climate is necessary um, for the learner to feel safe and have the opportunity to engage the educator and ask their questions, but it's insufficient in and of itself for learning. So brilliant teachers cannot promote learning without establishing good learning climates, and creating good learning climates is inadequate for teachers who lack expertise. Um, Delos described that in a system where there is low challenge and low support, there's educational stasis. When there's low challenge and high support, all this leads to is just confirmation. There's, there's no growth. When there's high challenge and low support, this causes fear and retreat. The optimum situation is high challenge and high support, which leads to growth in the development. Um, Yerkes and Dodson published on uh, the optimum amount of stress as required for tasks such as learning. So you have to have a little bit of stress in your environment in order to get things done. However, once you exceed this threshold, learning decreases. Learning is active. The most permanent type of learning occurs when learners are involved in their own learning process. They need to be able to define their goals. Uh, they need to be able to ask questions and um, actively participate. Adults need to see a reason for learning. They have to understand why what they're about to learn is important. Um, it needs to be applicable to their work, their responsibilities, or their interests. When instruction is problem-centered, it's also patient-centered, and that's, that's what we're all here to do, is to um, help take care of patients. Uh, the road to the diagnosis is more important than necessarily the right diagnosis. Learners acquire new skills and information as they problem-solve. So it's an emphasis on the process of learning, not necessarily the end. Instruction has to be experience-oriented. Adults need to connect new learning to their lifetime of knowledge and experiences. Past experiences are relevant to the understanding of their future problems. Teachable moments are an important way to do this. Feedback must be provided not only to learners, but also to teachers. Both parties need to know whether they are meeting stated educational goals so that there's mutual benefits. So where and exactly how do we teach? So if you replace teacher with coach, um, there's another very interesting body of literature about surgical coaching. Um, Don Shula is best known as the head coach of the Miami Dolphins. Um, he's arguably one of the best coaches. He certainly continues to hold the NFL record for most career wins as a head coach with um, you know, over 340. He was inducted to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1997. 
his quotation is that I think what coaching is all about is taking players and analyzing their ability and putting them in a position where they can excel within the framework for the team being successful. So what is a coach? International Coaching Federation defines coaching as a cooperative process between a coach and a coachee. This includes providing objective and constructive feedback to help a coachee recognize what works and also what can be improved. Help, um, other descriptions are helping someone else expand and apply his or her skills, knowledge, and abilities. Successful coaches are masterful communicators, and unsuccessful coaches often fail not because they lack knowledge of the sport, but because of their poor communication skills. Um, some additional quotations that were available are, uh, you've got to study and analyze each individual and find out what makes them tick. The ability to adapt, reading the situation, and figuring out what each person needs uh, is the key to being a good coach. Um, and this leads into um, some educational theory. The descriptions of coaching suggest a very important detail. So the coach or teacher or surgical educator needs to analyze or diagnose the coachee or the learner or the surgical trainee in order to provide effective instruction. Um, this is Bloom's revised taxonomy. Um, it is the backbone of most CME and residency programs lessons plans, um, assessments, simulations, and learning platforms um, because of the associations associated with each level of the Bloom's learning hierarchy from remembering to understanding to applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating reflect not only the educational goals, but also a learner's clinical experience. Um, the actions are a spectrum of simple to complex, going from the bottom here at simple to up as complex. And the associated verbs, utilizing questions um, with the associated verbs can help to identify where a learner is on the scale to identify their learning objectives and learning goals, and also in order to um, offer constructive feedback appropriate for their um, learning level. So again, questions can go, go from the um, more simple to the complex, starting off with, you know, just basic knowledge, you know, what's your differential diagnosis for chest pain or for abdominal pain? Um, do you understand the difference between colicky abdominal pain and pain out of proportion to examination? How do you apply this? What is the clinical significance of that? The teacher's essential skill is to ask effective questions. Mastery of questioning assumes, number one, the ability to listen to not interrupt, to read facial expressions, and adjust questions to the learner's level of understanding. When the teacher classifies questions based on Bloom's taxonomy of educational objectives, um, this provides a reproducible hierarchy, and um, higher order questions allow teachers to simultaneously assess learner's knowledge as well as clinical decision-making capacity. An example of this is, What's the differential diagnosis for a patient with back pain and fever, which is fairly straightforward, versus how would you evaluate the patient's back pain if she had fever? Specifically to medical students, Pangaro um, and colleagues described four stages of medical student progression. Um, and the mnemonic, which there's tons of mnemonics in the educational literature's rhyme, R-I-M-E, so they progress from reporter who can take reliable histories, perform physical examinations, and effectively communicate findings to their preceptors um, to an interpreter who then understands the meaning of patients' problems and is able to prioritize them into a differential diagnosis to a manager who can act on their diagnostic impressions um, by making executive decisions and tailoring plans to a patient's individual needs to an educator who is one who has gained a deeper knowledge of the discipline from, just regu from regular um, self-directed learning. They're also able to um, help teach their um, colleagues. 
this light blooms taxonomy is a um, progressive um, hierarchy. So you know, going up a level in the hierarchy means that you have demonstrated adequate competency in the preceding levels. From a teaching perspective, um, once you diagnose the learner and figure out where they are, that's at the point where you can teach. But it's you know, important to set the stage. A case presentation is a good way to um, make the um, point relevant and learner focus. Once you've figured out where they are in their understanding, you can tailor questions towards that and, um, and teach from there. Finally, it's always important to um, reinforce what was done right and correct mistakes. In the, op in, in the operating room, um, that's been harder to define what the optimum way to teach um, is. Uh, Deborah DeRosa, who was one of the recent um, keynotes at the Residence as Teachers uh, program by the ACS, has published extensively on this since um, the mid-80s. This was published in um, 2013 in the Journal of Surgical Education, and this defined this wide stage of supervision. So residents in the operating room progress from show and tell to smart help to dumb help to no help. Um, it's not the residents who progress, it's the attendings who progress. So the, um, there, is <laughs> there are associated attending behaviors with each one of these things. And um, I think one of the important things about this paper is that it defines cues to advancement from one step to the other. So how does an attending know that a resident is able to advance to where they need less help? This has also been used as an evaluation tool. So general conclusions about adult learning and um, teaching, um, avoid not giving feedback, avoid focusing on a personality trait rather than a behavior, um, allow students and learners to define their own educational goals. Um, don't do all the talking. As it turns out, lecture style things are less effective for overall learning. And don't be too busy to teach. And don't be boring when you teach. It's exciting. You should be invested. Things that you should try to do is um, you can ask a student to demonstrate what they had learned. So in order to reproduce that um, in a new way um, indicates um, ascension in the Bloom's hierarchy. When you give feedback, use the ask, tell, ask method, which we'll talk about in a minute. And um, you should define your objectives. <coughs> Without feedback, mistakes go uncorrected, good performance is not reinforced, and clinical competence is achieved empirically or not at all. So if you don't tell somebody how they're doing, how do they know how they're doing? <clears throat> feedback is tricky. Um, we're going to take a minute to talk about what it is not and what it is. Um, feedback can often be mistaken for reinforcement. Reinforcement is a statement expressing positive or negative reaction to a behavior which aims to increase or decrease the likelihood of that behavior happening again. Um, this is a value judgment. So. That was a great presentation. Well, great, that makes me feel good, but what does that actually mean? Is there something specific? Is there something actionable? Why was that feedback given? Versus, you need to work on your presentation skills. Okay, again, maybe that makes me feel bad, but that's not specific and it's not actionable. An evaluation is a qualitative judgment which rates a learner's performance. Um, these are often given um, in Likert scales and um, we talked about the milestones earlier. That would be an example of an evaluation. This is often the only measure of performance visible to the learner. It's usually given after the performance is over. And although change could be made in the future, it is too late to implement change for the um, present experience for which the evaluation was given. Feedback, on the other hand, is reinforcement or correction plus an explanation. This keeps you on course to meet your goals. It allows you to adjust your course 
to meet your goals, and it's also given immediately or shortly thereafter the performance um, when the learner still has time to demonstrate improvement. Over the past 10 years, this has been um, widely published in the literature. Um, this study was published in Surgical Endoscopy in 2007 and discusses what the impact of objective assessment and constructive feedback has on the improvement of laparoscopic performance in the operating room. And um, these graphs were really descriptive to me, which is why I included this one specifically. But um, they took two groups of surgeons. Um, they were novice laparoscopists who had li very limited previous experience with um, laparoscopy. So um, they had done between zero and 10 previous laparoscopic cholecystectomies. The median was two. Um, they were um, split into two groups. Group one uh, received feedback. Um, group two who did not. The group one surgeons had significantly greater improvement in their time to complete the procedure, their economy of movement scores, as well as their error scores. Um, these are described here pictorially. So control group, feedback group, time, error, and economy. And then among, you know, every category that was assessed, the surgeons in the feedback group improved to a greater degree. Um, this study uh, was published in 2015, also looking at a similar topic. Um, this was specific to um, simulator training. There were 16 students who completed the simulator training as well as the questionnaires, and again, Instrument path length was shorter in the feedback group as compared to control group. So we see that improvements in not only time to completion of laparoscopic tasks, um, either in humans or in simulators, there's a reduction of technical errors, and there are enhancements in the economy of movement. These have all been demonstrated by surgical trainees who are randomized to groups who receive constructive feedback compared with those receiving none. Um, we talked about coaching before. This has been um, another hot topic in the literature, in that surgical coaching enhances surgical skill in the operating room um, specific to that learner. So this was a randomized control trial published in the Annals of Surgery, and um, it was at a single training program. Trainees uh, undergoing a minimally invasive surgery rotation were randomized to either conventional training, which is the um, CT, versus comprehensive surgical coaching, which is the CSC. Uh, the conventional included ward and operating room duties uh, and regular departmental teaching sessions. The CSC, or the intervention group, included these, but it also comprised performance analysis, debriefing, feedback, and behavior modeling. The um, primary outcome measures were technical performance as measured on global and procedure-specific rating scales. Um, this is the, the OSATs, is the objective structured assessment of technical skill, and the BOSATS is the bariatric objective structured assessment of technical skill. This was specifically um, assessed on performing uh, jejuno jejunostomy. Operative performance was assessed by a blinded video analysis of the first and last cases recorded by the participants during their rotations. At post-training, which is the BL is the baseline score, and um, OSATs and BOSATs are out of uh, 35 being the highest score achievable, seven is the um, lowest score. So baseline versus um, post-test assessment, baseline versus post-test assessment. All three groups, performance increases. So comprehensive surgical coaching is not only beneficial for um, trainees um, at a lower level of training, but it's also um, applicable to physicians who have been in practice for a time. Um, Wisconsin Surgical published in um, 2015 uh, a coaching framework program that they hoped would be a systematic approach to the development 
of surgical coaching interventions and also as a guide to future work in the field. Um, they described coaching in its ability to target performance in both te or in technical skill, um, cognitive skill, as well as non-technical skills, and <clears throat> that there were three distinct but also interrelated activities of coaching. And this includes um, setting goals, encouraging and motivating, and also developing and guiding. Um, multiple high-impact publications have suggested that adoption of concepts from um, high-performance industries like coaching and professional sports as uh, alternative approaches to continuing medical education and surgical training. Um, coaching has been used in numerous contexts, including sports, business, relationships, and general life coaching. Um, it's grounded in multiple psychological constructs. Uh, there are several characteristics that are common to a broad range. This includes a systemic process. You have individualization to the end user. Um, the coach needs to be able to listen and question, and it also has to be goal-oriented. So why is this so important to talk about? Um, over the past several decades, um, surgical residency has changed significantly. There has been an imbalance between the increased scope of education and also the reduced number of work hours due to um, work hour restrictions. So you have a reduced amount of time uh, in order to provide the training. So you need more efficient and structured interoperative teaching. Surgical coaching has the, potentially, has the potential to address this. Um, Current teaching doesn't incorporate critical concepts of adult learning theory. Um, as we talked about before, adults learn best as active participants, active participants in a learning that builds on their individual needs. It's tailored to their past experience, has direct applicability on their daily lives. And they should participate in and identify their own goals and have the opportunity to practice what is learned and also have self-reflection and constructive feedback. Uh, the importance of self-reflection has been emphasized specifically by Erickson um, in advocating for deliberate practice. This means that um, most clinical practice do not include identification of areas for improvement by reflection on performance, followed by intentional adjustments in approach and evaluation of the resultant impact. So this deficiency can lead many practitioners to plateau in a state of proficiency. However, in contrast, in the sports world, professionals um, use coaching to facilitate deliberate practice and continued performance improvement. American College of Surgeons um, has recognized the importance of feedback. Um, they published this article uh, about feedback fundamentals and tips for success in 2015. Often it's difficult to find time for structured, meaningful, and comprehensive feedback sessions. So we need to learn how to give impactful feedback in small doses and perhaps a less structured or um, impromptu interaction throughout the course of the day. Um, there are generally three types of feedback. One is a, a brief feedback, like a two to five minute. It's usually on a clinical skill or in a learning situation. Um, there's formal feedback usually on like a presentation, it involves a dialogue between uh, learner and teacher, and then there's major feedback. These are um, you know, often like your, your mid-block evaluations where um, it's a very formalized process. Interesting thing to note is that this brief feedback is often not perceived as students as feedback unless it's specifically identified. There are also barriers to feedback that are personal from the um, person giving the feedback. So it's uncomfortable, I don't like it, no one ever gave me feedback, I don't know how to do it, I hated getting feedback, I don't like confrontation, I don't know if what I observed is actually a problem, I have had limited interaction with the student, I don't know what the goals are, it's not my job, there's not enough time. Um, this is one of the largest reviews of perioperative feedback in surgical training. So they analyzed 26 studies, 11 of which focused on resident and attending perceptions um, of teaching behaviors. 10 of those 11 referenced the disparity, difference, gap, divergence, these are all keywords used 
between the learner and teacher's perceptions of both perioperative teaching um, and feedback. Which means there's a pretty big divide that needs to be crossed. So how do we deliver effective feedback? Number one, you need to recognize feedback. Um, we'll talk about setting the stage and also signposting. You should provide effective feedback. We'll talk about the important components. Feedback should be timely, concise, actionable, and specific. You should also tailor feedback to your audience. There's a difference in giving feedback to medical students, residents, and also to attending surgeons. In order to recognize that feedback is being given, you need to set the stage. Um, you should um, have a relatively private, quiet place, um, establish goals that both educator and learner identify, define expectations for learning and interaction, um, and also minimize learner anxiety by setting the stage prior to a particularly stressful or technically difficult scenario. Um, and also establish an expectation and a culture of ongoing feedback. Signposting refers to actually using the word um, feedback. So like I mentioned, um, the brief feedback that's given, a great majority of learners do not recognize that it is actually feedback. Um, a, a paper published by Huddle suggested that faculty think that they provide feedback 91 to 97 percent of the time, while residents consistently report receiving useful feedback only 17 to 30 percent of the time. So when you use the word feedback, it's a buzzword, someone, can get, someone gets it and pays attention. Um, feedback, again, like we talked about, is easy to recognize in a structured setting, like a you know, mid-course evaluation, but it's also, but it's, it's more difficult um, to do in an impromptu feedback session that occurs usually in the operating room. Um, feedback in the OR is often disguised as technical tips or um, disapproving or approving speech or body language. Um, so if the surgical educator says something like, you know, approach the gallbladder this way, afterwards they could say something like, I hope that my feedback on your initial approach to the gallbladder was useful so that hopefully the learner will be like, oh, that was actually feedback, that was actually done. Um, or after the case, um, the educator could say, during the case, I gave you feedback on the best way to skeletonize the cystic duct, what you need to see in your critical view. Again, identify that that had been done. That way, um, you can establish goals for your next case based on that feedback. It's well-timed, it's expected, it's based on first-hand data, it's regulated in quantity phrased in descriptive language based on specific and remedial behaviors, not personality traits, um, and should be undertaken with teacher and learner working as allies with common goals. So um, in the midst of a stressful situation is not a great time to um, solicit or give um, feedback. Again, another mnemonic that is um, discussed in literature is um, fit, able, so frequent, interactive, timely, appropriate for learner level, behavior specific and balanced, labeled, like we talked about signposting, and also empathetic. So you can be sensitive to the social context when giving feedback. Um, as a general rule of thumb, you should praise in public and correct in private. So there are some strategies to feedback. Um, there was the, we'll call it the old sandwich, which is a praise criticism and a praise. Um, the new sandwich that is discussed is an ask, tell, ask. So you start off by, um, should also be limited in quantity. This would be too much of a sandwich. That's a much better sandwich. So ask, ask the learner to assess their own performance. That way you as the teacher can figure out like where they're coming from and what their baseline is. Ask what went well, what they think could have been done better, what were their goals? Um, you also set the stage for a reflective practice and also self-directed learning. So next you tell what you observed. So um, during that laparoscopic colostectomy, I observed your hand position was um, not optimal. Um, 
you can react to learner's observations. You can include positive and um, corrective elements. Next, you can ask about the feedback recipient's understanding of your feedback um, and also discuss strategies for improvement. Feedback should be tailored. So again, your goals for the medical student are different from those of your residents. Medical students are often assigned concrete tasks. These include collecting vitals, changing dressings, retracting the operating room, everyone's favorite, or holding the laparoscope, everyone's second favorite. Um, you should divine, define the learning goal for the medical students together. Um, the tasks expose the student to different components of surgical care, um, but it's the student's understanding of these components that should be assessed. So if the student's job is to collect all the vitals for rounds, um, feedback should not be given on their handwriting or if they transposed a you know, two and a seven, um, but what should be assessed is if someone has abnormal vital signs and that the student understands why that's important. So your learning point here is, that, is tachycardia in a post-operative patient. So you should talk about what that could mean and why that's concerning, or post-operative fever. Um, you can talk about you know, what are the reasons for having post-operative fever. If there um, is a drain in a patient, you can talk about the expected character of a wound drainage, not necessarily that it put out you know, 20 milliliters, but also, you know, what is the character of it? I mean, there's a difference between serosanguinous drainage and someone who has post um, gram patch versus bile in your JP. Those mean two very different things. So focus on the understanding of these findings for medical students. For residents, two main goals, mastering technical operative skills and also patient management. So feedback should be specific to those domains um, and also should be specific to their level of training. So interns may not be able to perform lap coli skin to skin with minimal guidance, but they should be able to define the anatomy, describe how an operation would change based on preoperative labs like a transaminitis or hypervilorubinemia and um, discovered intraoperative pathology. Like if you find cholelithiasis, well, that means you're probably going to need to do cholangiogram instead of just um, cholecystectomy. On the other hand, senior surgical residents um, would be expected to perform all aspects of the surgical encounter from consent, positioning, setup, planning your operation, um, and also post-operative care. Next, feedback should be given to people who are teaching you. This is called upward feedback. Um, it's necessary and appropriate. It reinforces the positive aspects um, of the interaction, enhances collegial and educational relationships in a positive learning climate. It can improve patient safety. It's also mutually beneficial for not only the um, learner, but for also the teacher. Surgeons who take jobs at academic hospitals um, and who are involved in regi resident education know that a huge part of their job is teaching medical students and residents, and it's a vital responsibility. Um, upward feedback is necessary for all parties to gain the most from an educational experience. Um, it certainly can be intimidating, but um, it is appropriate for residents to approach an attending and provide feedback after an educational opportunity. Um, it is important to know that this kind of feedback, the purpose of it is to reinforce the positive interactions and the positive aspects of the interaction in order to better the collegial and educational relationship between the surgical, surgical trainee and surgical educator. Um, this bi-directional feedback um, is a dialogue and it develops a positive learning climate. You have open and honest dialogue and um, this can also provide trainees a greater degree of comfort in discussing perhaps concerns about patient, a patient with superiors and that's how it ultimately improves patient safety. Um, for the learner, um, it can define what teaching behaviors work for them. It can reinforce for the teacher what positive and helpful teaching behaviors um, work. Um, it allows the trainee to realize the importance in taking an active role in their own learning process. So again, the trainee needs to be engaged in that process. Um, 
It also benefits search and educators. So it can provide an opportunity to develop different aspects of clinical teaching, identify strong and weak points in their own teaching, gain awareness about what individual trainees need for their learning process so that your instruction is relevant and learner focused. Um, it also allows the teacher to understand the importance of explicit exchange of thoughts, um, utilizing clear communication and defining learning goals for a particular educational experience. You can also lead by example to instill teaching values. So if you lead by example by expecting feedback to be given to you, then that helps influence the climate. Um, so how and when should this be done? Well, if you have already established that you're going to have a you know, regularly scheduled expected post-operative debriefing, um, that's a good time to do this. So for residents and um, juniors, seniors, examples of effective upward feedback include things like, I noticed you allowed me a chance to struggle before offering suggestions in that operation that really helped me figure out what I needed to do for next time. Or if um, you have a well dot moment in the case, um, and then you were unsure that time, you could say something like the last time we, whatever you asked me what I would do, I was unsure so I used the opportunity to educate myself on blah, 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 blah. This expresses to the teacher that um, allowing you that freedom or leeway was helpful in your um, education understanding. Or if you didn't understand what the feedback that was given actually meant, clarify it. That way you don't make the same mistake again. Or you um, express the same desired behaviors again. In summary about feedback, um, feedback should be an opportunity, it's not a criticism. You should use feedback to help um, develop a collegial and positive educational relationship. Feedback should always be thoughtful and actionable. This is the most useful and performing feedback. Um, it can be and should be bi-directional. Um, and well ed executed feedback produces measurable improvements in technical skill um, using things like um, standardized tools for assessing improvement should be used like milestones or OSATs or something like that. The important thing to remember about feedback in medical education is that it's necessary, it's valuable, and after a bit of practice and planning, it's not as difficult as one might think. That was published in JAMA in 1983. Any questions? have a whole list of things. Dr. Giles, I, I, I want to, we'll skip around a little bit and I'll try to organize some of my thoughts. That was a, that was a, a very excellent presentation. Having been recently involved over the last three years in the development of a committee at the College of Surgeons on coaching, I think it's hard for you all to realize what a good uh, discussion this was. This is very thorough. So thank you for that. Um, I certainly want a copy of your slides to share with my committee at the, at the college. Uh, I think that <clears throat> the discussion about feedback, <clears throat> I get uh, one chance to, with each uh, medical student group to sit down with them for an hour and talk about uh, their experiences here and critique what uh, has, has happened. And uh, when we look at the uh, the, the gold stars for the program. <clears throat> there are a lot of them here, including the fact that our residents, for the most part, are very interested in teaching uh, and, and understand, I think all of you understand from the recruitment time here, is that we expect residents to teach because part of our philosophy has always been that you don't really know something well until you can help someone else learn how to do it, either by teaching them or explaining it to them because you really don't know how to do it or don't don't understand why the the diverticulum perforated in the patient with the colon uh, unless you can explain it to somebody else you don't really understand how to take care of it so I think we've we've done a good job of that uh, the one thing that that consistently comes out though is the expectation part that you had what are you expected to learn and and we struggle with that and we try to do better with that. I think the residents do and faculty do with each student group about what is expected on this rotation. And then feedback is the other thing that they say they would like to have more of. So we get a lot of gold stars about good things and then we get what I call brown lumps about some of the things in terms of feedback and, uh, 
and expectation. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that you sort of touched on, uh, in fact did touch on, and that is the uh, immediate feedback with operations in particular. And so I want uh, Dr. Giles in particular to talk about this because one of the things that uh, you brought out and has been shown to be true is that feedback at the time of the operation or at least feedback at some point about how you're doing operatively is important and, and he's worked on some apps for phones and things like that for faculty to be able to uh, evaluate how you're doing so that we can give you better feedback. Uh, he in particular can. He, do you want to make mention of that uh, in your comments? Make whatever comments you want to otherwise or ask whatever questions as well. Sure. Well, Mary Catherine, first of all, that was excellent. And I've given a couple of brief kind of presentations to our faculty at the retreats, but nothing nearly that uh, in, in depth and detailed. So that was excellent, and I appreciate that. And I as well want to see those slides because I think there were a lot of good points in there for sure about both way feedback. And I think that's, you know, we lack in all of that as far as uh, our ability to provide it because. Once again, it is difficult to tell someone sometimes, especially very educated, very uh, accomplished people, uh, what they're doing wrong because we've never failed very much before. People that get to this, this particular level have not had a lot of failure in their life, and uh, so it's hard to tell them when they're not doing something well, but if they could do it, they wouldn't need to be here at this point. So I think that's where the struggle is, and we're continually trying to improve that process uh, as far as some things that we can do before and one of the questions that I have for you was the hardest thing that I found when starting and it's one of the things that you'll you will see as well as you progress through your career is being able to differentiate how you should give feedback to different levels of, of, of learner and so uh, one of the hardest parts was doing a gallbladder with a second year versus doing a gallbladder with a fifth year or a sixth year and what and I think you you hit on the I think what I have come up with as the points of how you, how you in your mind kind of go through it is you have to s set the goals at the beginning. You got to talk to them at the beginning because if you don't, it's, you can't really get that framework in your mind of what your goals for them are, what their goals are, and then how how well they did throughout the procedure. Because the second year is going to go slower. They're going to have more struggles. You're going to have to give more um, guidance. And so understanding that on the front end is important so that you set the framework for the rest of the case. And so did you see anything specific about other than kind of talking about it on the front end and doing that initial assessment uh, before you start the case on how, how to do that for different stages of learning as far as different levels of resident as they proceed through and what are better ways to, to try to set that framework in your mind? So I think that, I think that this goes back to um, you have to diagnose the learner on the front end so the, um, the preoperative um, briefing is a really great way to do that. You know, get a baseline about how they feel about their comfort level with the operation. So doing a gallbladder, you know, how have you done these before? That's, that's, a, good, that's a good place to start. Um, you know, which parts of the case were you allowed to do? Because, you know, like you have identified before with the intern curriculum, there's a huge difference in laparoscopic skill between holding the camera and then actually trying to dissect out the structures. Um, those are two very different things. So if you've participated in, you know, 30 holding the cameras, but you have done zero dissecting out structures, um, your baseline is going to be very different than someone who has, you know, only participated in 10 lap coles, but they've dissected out structures in all 10 of those. That's a, that's a completely different area. So I think you know, having that conversation is important. Um, the, the Zweiss scale that was um, described by DeRosa is a good um, tool to use, but then that oftentimes, you know, that first time you interact with a, with a um, learner, you just you have to be very cognizant of where they are and, you know, think about how much coaching or how much guidance they actually need um, during the case to figure out how much freedom you can give them. But you know, we've got 30 residents, we've got 100 faculty, you know, it's, it's very difficult to do that on an individualized scale for each um, trainee. Something I learned from Dr. Stanley is that, you know, going into an operation, you can say things like, I'm going to give you 10 minutes to do this part. 
and then we're gonna switch. And then I'm gonna give it back to you, if we can, obviously depending on the patient's pathology, but having a um, time-limited opportunity to struggle or opportunity to progress um, allows for a defined end so that when the teacher says, hey, I'm gonna switch with you, you don't feel like a kicked puppy because it's expected. You expect them to say, you expect them to take over the case at that time point and then get you moved along. Um, so I think just expectations are very important. Other comments, uh, questions from other people? Um, well, okay, then let me, <clears throat> let me make a, a, a couple of other observations, uh, jump around a little bit. Um, first of all, uh, the giving the bad news and critiquing is not easy to do. Uh, in my generation and even Dr. Giles' generation, approach this differently because of our life experiences. Uh, and it's something that uh, I would tell all of you that I think it would uh, be good to avail yourself of spending some time every year in a lecture similar to this uh, about ways to improve what you do in teaching because it's something that we don't do well. One of the things we, we, that we do well in surgery and in medicine period is we try to educate uh, our peers. Uh, but we don't always know how to give bad news good. Uh, and so we just don't give anything. So we sit around and talk to each other about how badly somebody's doing, but we never write it down and we never give feedback to them about it in a positive way. And it's very difficult to learn to do. Dr. Giles is working on that with our faculty. And it's one of the things that we have as a goal to try to improve over the next couple of years because uh, we know, uh, at least from evaluations of millennials in particular, that, uh, that, that they learn much better if you can structure that better. Um, the older generation, have you had it there about, oh, the praise, criticism, praise. I mean, that's, that's kind of the way, that's what I grew up with. You know, you were a good boy one day and you were terrible two, 10 minutes later and then you were a good boy tomorrow. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I think that still permeates surgical education to, uh, to some extent. The issue about coaching is really very interesting in this committee that I'm talking about at the college is actually at least temporarily titled that. Uh, and it took me a while to understand the difference between coaching and mentorship because I guess I always kind of thought of it when you hear people talk about a coach, uh, it was always in the idea of a person who um, could get you um, motivated uh, to do well. Uh, and in fact, that's not the coach. Uh, you know, a coach may be somebody you hate uh, or might not really respect, but they helped you learn something particularly well. And so uh, it's one of the things that we're working on at the college to develop actually uh, a program in teaching people how to coach. Uh, Dr. Arnold has been over uh, to one of the uh, training case, uh, courses that we had in how to teach or how to coach with simulation training, uh, for example. Uh, and we're trying to emphasize the opportunity for uh, surgeons near the end or, or even after retirement, near the end of their career or after retirement to continue to give them an opportunity to do that. Uh, so there is a difference in coaching. Coaching is a, a, you know, can, can be for a very specific thing. Coaching how to start an IV for a medical student and never have any more exposure to them. Or you could be like Dr. Moore and be the mentor for life for multiple people, uh, which involves helping them deal with uh, clinical problems, personal problems, professional problems, all wrapped up. That's mentoring, and it's a long time or a lifelong type of exposure, which I'd gotten, it's taken me a long time to sort of separate the two, and I'm still struggling with it a little bit because I see a blending of those things to a great extent, but at any rate. It's just an important, it's something for you to, maybe Maybe you all already know all that and I'm just now learning it, but uh, it's, it's taken me a while to get uh, an, an, an understanding of it. I think what other point to re briefly make to all the residents, is we talk about coaching, you talk about feedback, as a surgeon in particular, all that's in there. But one of the things, and you touched on it, but you didn't spend a long time, and that's practice. 
And just because you've established something and been able to learn how to do it, if you don't practice it as a surgeon, that's, you're not going to get good at it. I'm, all of you are tired of hearing me say Michael Jordan shot 10,000 foul shots before he got to where he was really that good. He had a lot of natural talent, all of you do. But if you don't practice it, then you're not going to really get that good at it. And that's why we established the skills lab years ago was to provide the opportunity for people to do it. And we've been frustrated in not being able to have it utilized as much as we think it should be. But it's gotten a lot better lately. And uh, I think the coaching there has improved substantially. And I'm proud of the fact that Nick Belay in particular has pushed on uh, to help get that improved and, may, and, and make people understand that this really can help you when you get in the clinical arena over here. So. It's a, it's, it's a good thing. I just wanted to emphasize that, that practice is important, and we're trying to make it available to you to use as much as you can. I'd like to, to add to the practice is that you need to practice the right way. Yeah. yeah. So you need to, I mean. That, that's true if you've been taught how to do it. I mean, there actually are some basic studies that show, you know, with, the, with simulation training uh, and things like doing this and fund application, if you don't practice it, then you lose, you, you drop back. You never go back to, to zero level, but you don't stay at the level where you were when you're initially coached in how to do it unless you practice it. And uh, so, so anyway. Uh, <clears throat> I could go on and on of taking more notes than I usually do. I want to make, uh, want to welcome Mary Catherine's mother here uh, one of our physicians on staff. We're happy you're here. Uh, and I'm really sorry that uh, this presentation had to be crammed in to here and we couldn't do it uh, on the day of the alumni weekend because Dr. Eastman in particular would really enjoy hearing this. So I'll probably, with your uh, agreement, I'll probably share your slides with him because he's very interested in this. I think one other point I would make to, in closing is just say that you know, in medicine, we do, one of the things that separates us as professionals is that we do teach each other. Uh, we actually, if you look at it uh, in a business sense, we train our competition going forward. And in most cases, like uh, here, uh, nobody gets really paid for that. Now, there are circumstances where that's not true. But in surgery in particular, I mean, you guys would be staggered to see how little money people get paid uh, from any outside source for being your teachers in the department of surgery. Uh, it, it probably, if you look at the total budget for incomes of surgeons in our department, I would say it's probably something like 2%. Uh, it might be as high as 5%, as but if it is, it would stagger me. And so you have people willing to do that. Uh, and so I think that's something that separates us from people that run Ace Hardware stores or 7-Elevens or uh, work in retail. Uh, we willingly train uh, our, the future uh, to take care of us. Uh, so I think that's something that we ought to all be proud of and continue to, to uh, cherish. Uh, and I will have to say it's my observation that corporate medicine uh, particular with uh, all physicians now working more and more shift work, it's harder and harder to continue with that uh, that that uh, culture, if you will, going forward. So I think you <coughs> young residents, as you go forward, need to keep that in mind. It's going to be hard for you to do, but it's very important for you to do, because without it, the quality of of health care and the physicians we have will not be uh, nearly as good. Uh, very. Very, very well done job, Mayor Catherine. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Off. Make sure you get me a copy of your yes, sir. slides, okay? I sure will. Thank you. All right.